We're good. Okay, great. Welcome everybody and thank you for coming and thank you for bearing with us for the technical difficulties a little bit. Um, this is the Peace and Justice Studies um, virtual conference and uh, we are happy to have uh, two speakers today who are going to talk around the topic of reframing for more constructive outcomes. Um, this this section of our PGSA conference has been focused on polarization, as you know. Um, in, in the chat box, I will put in, and I want to invite people to be sure we have a number of other events happening over the next couple of days, um, some later this afternoon and evening. And of particular interest is the PGSA annual student awards ceremony and membership meeting, which is at seven Eastern time uh, tonight. It goes from seven to eight thirty. It's an open link. I'll put the link back in. I put it in earlier, but I'll put it back in for people who did, weren't able to get it. It's an open link to the to our membership meeting because we want people to come out and meet the board and see what we do. So my name is. I guess I should have introduced myself earlier. My name is Jeremy Rinker. I teach at the University of North Carolina Greensboro in the Peace and Conflict Studies Department. You see my picture behind me. Um, and uh, and uh, we're happy to have you here. I am also the, the institutional liaison for the board. So if you have an institutional membership through your university or through your organization, then I'm the one that you, you get in contact with and set that up. Um, and so we're, we're kind of on a membership drive. Part of the goal of this conference is to help bring in members, uh, both individual and institutional. Um, and so I thank you for coming to the conference today. We're, this has been a, a long kind of three month conference. We're coming close to the end now, only a few sessions left, but we're glad to see folks still hanging on and talking about polarization, which is a really important topic here um, in our world in the, in the last month or so, particularly. Um, so we have two speakers today. Um, we're gonna switch the order from what you see on the schedule. So Anushka Luna, I think I say her, her last name right, who's an independent scholar, is gonna talk on stigma as a type of violence. And Linda Groff from California State Institute, uh, State University uh, is gonna be talking on reframing reality for the coronavirus, job loss and needed racial justice age, implications for peace studies and different aspects of peace. So those are our two presentations today. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Agnushka to begin, to begin and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time after both of them speak to have some conversation and ask some questions. So uh, I'll facilitate that question and answer towards the end and help out as I'm needed. But if you do have questions along the way and if the speakers are okay with it, you can put them in the chat box. I can, we can either save them to the end or if they feel like they wanna respond to the chat box, then they can certainly respond to questions in the moment. That's the great thing about being online. So thanks for coming to Peace and Justice Studies and I'll pass off to you. Um. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to the organizers and the attendees for having us here. Um, there we go. So originally, Dr. Francisco Quintana was going to be my co-presenter, but due to the COVID pandemic and other situations, he was unable to make it. And uh, what we're hoping to, to do by presenting uh, on a chapter that we actually both wrote is to get feedback because we were shooting blanks about a subject that uh, we were caught off guard by. And that is we at a time, sorry, I can't, there we go. Um, at a time when we were both affiliated with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Florida International University, we were asked to write about the relationship between stigma and dehumanization um, in healthcare, in a context of healthcare. And the reason for that is that even though there's all of this idealistic mythology about healthcare professions being uh, very caring and uh, geared towards healing and curing, um, stigma and dehumanization are both phenomena that are consistently noted as being present in patient experiences as well as uh, care providers' experiences. Now, Francisco. Uh, is a psychologist and at the time he was working, he had been working for several years with traditionally stigmatized populations such as the homeless 
and the um, mentally ill um, throughout uh, different areas, different regions in South Florida. I, on the other hand, have a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution, and my subject of dissertation was dehumanization. So they asked us to, to put together these two subjects and looked at, look at the relationship because uh, not only are, there, are they present in healthcare, but they are also so often um, mentioned in relation to one another. To our surprise, what we found was that the relationship between these two phenomena hasn't really been explored. And furthermore, when we started looking at how um, both stigma and demonization were defined, even though they are intuitively different phenomena, we couldn't, we couldn't really uh, explain how they were different when we started looking at the examples and the concepts and themes that they were connected to. So if you look at the literature on stigma, it has been variously associated with labels, with stereotypes, with status loss, discrimination, and the idea that it's a mark that defines negatively uh, individuals. But if you've also read through the literature on dehumanization, particularly in the context of war and genocide, and even in healthcare, these are also subjects that dehumanization tends to be connected to. So when we started looking at the examples, they tended to be applied to the same things. So we were dumbfounded. And um, what we're hoping is that if we are onto something by redefining stigma uh, in light of dehumanization, that we can get feedback because we're not sure if we're on the right track. So these are some of the, so that you can see, some of the concepts that um, stigma and dehumanization tend to be associated. These are both phenomena that are um, that define group boundaries. It all relies on who's in and who's out. What, how do we build identities? And these are favorable versus unfavorable identities. They're value-based as to who is preferred versus who is not preferred. Um, they rely on how we organize ourselves socially. That is who we end up outcasting versus who ends up as being included, and who has the power to actually enforce those group boundaries. One of the resulting aspects of it uh, is uh, discrimination, uh, the lack of resources, access, et cetera. In both cases, uh, they're safe to justify both stigma and dehumanization, the exclusion of individuals, say from um, the allocation of resources, uh, group memberships, identity, community, et cetera. And they enable discrimination and even aggression, aggression in the sense of violence, physical violence, and other types. Themes associated with individuals who are dehumanized and stigmatized tend to be a pollution. They, they can, they're dirty, they can actually affect us, and they represent uh, contagious um, possibility. They can be contagious. So you have uh, euphemisms for these individuals, such as uh, animal euphemisms, or labels such as rats, um, demons. Um, they are parasites, cancers, uh, individuals who live off and leech off society. There is this notion that they're immoral compared to the um, insiders group that it's actually moral. And they're built on prejudice. Um, and uh, the perpetuation of social isolation, then it's also based partially um, to some degree in historical marginalization. So the two most common examples that we came across in the case of stigma um, is uh, the labeling of HIV AIDS as a gay disease, even though it's a disease that actually affects uh, individuals across ages, um, genders, groups, et cetera. And it relies on the historical marginalization of the LGBT community as um, non-favor and discriminate against, right? In the case of dehumanization, the most common example is the Holocaust. Um, a lot of these themes are actually found in the context of the Holocaust, the Jewish population as being rats, as being polluters, um, cancers of society built on uh, partly religious prejudice going back to the Middle Ages and before. Then there were demons that would drain the blood out of uh, Christian children and other narratives. So there was a lot of similarities 
um, across the two phenomena. Now, there was one major distinction, and that is unlike dehumanization, stigma is consistently seen as a negative phenomenon. It's universal, it's present in every culture across the world, but it is seen as negative. Dehumanization, on the other hand, uh, in several instances is perceived and stated as an adaptation tool, right? Uh, for individuals who are in professions or in contexts where uh, they have to do um, otherwise deemed morally reprehensible actions, um, it's an adaptation tool that helps them to justify these actions. So say, for instance, a healthcare professional who has to inflict pain in order to procure cure, right? So they have to dissociate themselves from the patient as a human entity in order to be able to inflict pain. Um, in the case of the military, if you're in a, a context of war where violence is what you have to uh, do, um, then it actually allows them to look at other individuals as not humans and justify the fact that they deserved to be killed, they deserve to be maimed, they deserve to be tortured. So in as an adaptability tool, dehumanization is seen as uh, something positive, right? So why is it that it's important to differentiate between these two seemingly very similar phenomena? And if we're looking at a situation, how do we assess the presence of either one of them? How do we target um, either one of them? If, we, if it becomes challenging to actually differentiate between the two, um, how do we target one with the awareness that targeting one particular uh, either stigma or dehumanization may actually lead to a ripple effect of other phenomena connected to them. So when we started talking about all the themes associated with stigma, um, what it made me think of was the literature about uh, the definition of uh, violence, right? So a lot of the things that happen to individuals who are stigmatized tend to be um, uh, job loss, uh, dissociation from families, families that exclude them, friends then turn their backs on them. Um, so they lose uh, their ability to actually provide themselves with uh, physiological needs, um, with shelter, with a job, with self-fulfillment because of their stigmatization. Um, it reminded us of uh, the needs actually uh, explained by Maslow, but also needs uh, explained by in some of his tests by Johan Galton, who actually looks at survival identity. Um, and I can't remember the other ones, but, but those needs actually expounded by Galton actually overlap with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and because there is uh, a lack of fulfillment of these multiple types of needs, then it constitutes a harm, right? And, and also that leads us into Galton's definition of violence, which is any avoidable insult to basic human needs. If you can't provide yourself with shelter, if you can't uh, feel yourself like you're a member of the human community, if you can't have your rights secure, all of these are not just an insult, but a violation, right? Um, and so I had Nicola and Schupen in their book on uh, violence. They also talk about the definition of violence as any uh, action or structural arrangement that results in physical and non-physical harm. And so there is the overlap of harm and needs that you can see in what happens when a particular population is stigmatized. Um, the principles of violence uh, also explained by Adi Collin and Schubert also overlap with a lot of the dynamics that affect stigmatized individuals. It relies on power. It can be used to ascertain group boundaries. It relies on hierarchies because someone has to enforce those boundaries and someone has to allocate the resources to enforce. It's culturally transmitted. It relies on values. The only uh, principles that we were not too keen on were anything, particularly number 10, that actually looked at causation. Because we were still struggling with how to define it and how to differentiate the two phenomena, we did not feel comfortable saying that one phenomenon was the cause of the other phenomena and vice versa. We just know based on the literature that the two are linked. Who comes, which one comes first, it's still um, to be determined. And uh, something to keep in mind is that the idea of legitimacy versus illegitimacy or illegality versus uh, legality 
um, uh, sometimes laws exist to actually protect rights of stigmatized populations. But if you have cultures, power dynamics that actually turn their back on the enforcement of these laws, then uh, stigmatized populations are still on the losing end. And so this led, uh, led us to the, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> because uh, stigma and also dehumanization actually rely on the relationship between the interpersonal level, the institutional and the structural level, how we organize societies, it become, they become um, a loop in which one level affects the next and so forth. Um, so that led us to this redefinition. What we came up with is that stigma is a type of violence and the notion of rejection harm marked by the rejection of an individual, including the self, based on a real or imagined attribute deemed deviant, threatening, or immoral. Now, including the self, we actually uh, stated that because uh, Francisco actually had several patients that he could recall of who, because of stigmatization of their mentally ill illness, they fear disclosing that they were suffering. And so they fear reaching out, either telling their employers or telling family members or uh, using the resources because in at least one case, one of the healthcare providers actually did not behave in the best way, did not make the individual welcome or understood. And so what happens is even though the resource was available, he did not go back to that provider. So stigma is not just about how others see you, but also how eventually you see yourself. And dehumanization, I just defined it as um, a meaning making tool because uh, even though over the past 20 to 30 years, dehumanization, uh, the field of social psychology has actually produced a chunk of the literature on dehumanization and has actually redefined it as a mind perception through neuroimaging or the perception of primary versus secondary emotions in, in everyday uh, infrahumanization. That's um, the theory of infrahumanization by Layens et al. Overall, the humanization is just a maybe making tool. It applies to not just the perpetrators of violence um, and those who are dehumanized, but if the dehumanized are um, in a context of conflict, violent conflict, uh, the dehumanize internalizes uh, the idea of dehumanization, then it also becomes about self-dehumanization. So you can see then the relationship, one helps to mediate the other one through the negative meanings associated with it. And uh, stigma is, so it becomes uh, primarily defined in terms of harm, the harm that it causes rather than the mark that it's characterized by. So, we welcome feedback and um, let us know. Thank you for having us again. Great, thank you. So Linda, our, we're gonna pass over to you at this point. And, and like I said before, if people have questions and wanna put them in the chat, we can come back to them at the end or if others wanna address them, uh, we can find time for that. So feel free to use the chat for that function. I think you're muted, Linda. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Sorry, I, I think you're still muted for my end. I don't know if that's just a computer lag for me. Oh, wait, now, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Okay, good, okay. All right, so uh, my topic is reframing reality for the coronavirus age. And that's what I first started looking at as soon as this started taking over and, you know, like officially by March, but starting to be discussed a lot in February this year. And then at the related job loss resulting from the coronavirus and then the also racial justice age meaning also that minorities and various groups uh, and there's also the George, George Floyd killing um, magnified this issue 
um, so that this all becomes intertwined, these different three issues. And then I'm going to look. So the first part will be ne next. Can I, if, yeah. So basically what I'm covering is first um, a number of issues about the coronavirus itself and different aspects and how it relates to economic impacts and so on and, and inequalities. And then the second part will be looking at implications for peace studies field and work I've done. I have a book coming out on that includes like uh, seven different evolving definitions of what is peace. So I thought it would be really interesting to look at the impacts of the, all of this on these different aspects of peace. So that's the next part. And then the last part, I've also for years done future studies. And I also think that, you know, future star always for lo looking for new emerging trends and issues that need to be dealt with. So fairly early on, I got that this issue, that the coronavirus in particular initially, and then these other related issues would have a big impact on our future. So I'm going to then end with some implications for future studies field and for our future futures. Futures, so I say plural, not singular. That you know, there's not just one future, but various alternative futures. Okay, next. I have a lot here. So timeline. A lot of you probably know this, but the coronavirus began in China in in December. But and the doctor there that note that announced this new virus ended up getting it himself and he was first denounced for doing that but then later the the whole um, makeup of the virus get, was given by china globally to people which was a positive thing to develop vaccines but other issues are by by mid uh, march the trump administration finally said I, I want to apologize by the way i have a phd in international relations and i always like to take a global uh, look at things but on some of the coronavirus i have a more focus on the US just because there was so much there and you know I can the the global part I will probably add more later but but anyway in by mid march uh, finally the trump administration announced that this was a serious thing uh, before that they kept denying it and then after that though the the trump administration was quite quite derelict in taking the whole thing seriously and uh, I'll look at some of the issues of that later. The one thing that became very interesting was Bob Woodward in his new book on the current, on the Trump administration that uh, said that he had private interviews with Trump about his presidency and that Trump told him that back in February, he knew that the virus was at least five times more de deadly than any flu and that it was also airborne and therefore more dangerous for contagion of other people. And yet he's, he continued publicly to discount the, the dangers of the virus and to say, oh, it'll just go away magically or, you know, it's right. And even now saying it's just around the corner to go away. And he just has not taken it really seriously. So, so anyway, um, next. So this was an interesting article that I saw that was came out in March 17th by Thomas Friedman of the New York Times. And he suggested fairly early on that the corona, you know, initially there was a big debate, is this virus going to have much impact on our lives or not? But he came out with suggesting that there were going to be at least two periods. One is before the coronavirus and the next will be after the coronavirus because it will change our lives a lot. And then I looked at that and I said, I think there's going to be three periods. So the first period is before the coronavirus, which in the United States was dominated by Trump's attempted policy or non-policy policy to deal with it. Then there's the during, which is during the coronavirus period, which is all the efforts we're still in the middle of trying to deal with it, which can also have substages. Like for example, we had a first wave and now we're definitely in a second wave with the fall. And then there would be an, a, a, a a period after the coronavirus about what emerges later um, after we've got a handle on all this because vaccines are available and we've brought the, 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 the threat of it spreading down considerably. So it's not a threat anymore, but um, I, I want to just say that that period is not going to be just a return to the previous period before the virus. I think, you know, it will be some kind of a new normal. Okay, next. Okay. Um, well, I, I said, okay, so for the U.S., the period before the coronavirus was, was, was what uh, was Trump's values and policies and the period during is, his, is the, what I've argued and I'll go into a bit more later about 
in order what i'm arguing and i'll show you in a minute is that the values and policies needed to deal effectively with the coronavirus are the exact opposite of the values and policies dominating the trump administration and i'll come back to that okay next um okay two key concepts which probably you're maybe all familiar with containment and mitigation containment is if you get a hold if you start dealing with the virus early on and you you um have to take it very seriously from the beginning and then whenever you know you have adequate testing of everybody all the time and then if somebody tests positive for the virus then they self-isolate for 14 days and then you also do contact tracing where you talk to them about all their contacts and then they have to also self-isolate for 14 days and that's the way to get on top of it early and like countries like south korea is an example that was very good at doing that and um China, after a, a many problems, got theirs down too. And so, you know, what, we haven't been very good at that. So if you don't start taking it seriously initially, then you go on to mitigation, where what we tried to do um, earlier was to have people self-isolate, you know, at home, and then that cut back businesses, and then people get upset if their business is hurt and so on. But that's all you can do if you didn't take it seriously at the beginning. And the problem now is in we're, we're in a stage now with a new second wave, but I think there's a general consensus, consensus now that you don't want to shut down the whole society if possible, but you may have certain hot spots where you shut down those areas for a couple of weeks or more um, till you get a handle on things again. But for example, you know, New York just sh shut their schools um, as a re example of a temporary situation that they were trying to deal with. Um, okay, next. Okay, economic impacts of the coronavirus. Um, there's all kinds of industries that have been hurt really badly, you know, travel airlines and so on, hotels. Um, many small businesses have been very, small businesses have been very badly hit and are many going out of business, which is gonna have huge still ongoing economic replications for all those people and for everybody. And, um, so, and local governments are also hurting terribly because in states, because they run out of money trying to deal with the virus and need help of federal government stimulus. Uh, another important point is, you know, Trump was trying to argue this will be a V-shaped curve and then we'll just re, re come, but the economy will come back. But most people think we have more of a K-shaped curve, meaning for a few people that get to work at home and um, have stocks and you know still have their job, for them, their situation may be getting better. Um, but for many, many people, the, the curve is going down on the K and they're dealing with very difficult situations. And there are many Americans already that are just living paycheck to paycheck. So this virus certainly didn't help at all. Next. I don't know if that whole screen was showing. Okay. So now we're in a second wave, as I said, with great spikes happening all over the country. Europe was also having that same situation. Um, and Asia sometimes has done better, some Asian countries. Um, but, you know, we, you know, I think the other thing to say right here is that, that um, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, um, it's an ongoing issue that we're still not through and people are looking now for the emergence of viruses. I mean, vac excuse me, vi vaccines that could help us get this under control, but I'll get to that in a minute. Next. Okay, I just tried to look at values of Trump, which are to divide everybody, to blame everybody for everything. You know, I'm not a big Trump supporter and I've done earlier presentations at Peace Studies conferences on nonviolent resistance movements in the age of Trump. So, you know, I'm, I mean, I found it kind of horrifying when he came to be president because he's never tried to bring everybody together. He just, you know, appeals to his base and so on versus what's needed to deal with this virus is for everyone to cooperate. Everyone is vulnerable to the virus and we need to, you know, anybody can spread it to anybody else. So it's, you know, it's very important that we all cooperate and try to follow some scientific guidelines about how to reduce the danger of it uh, much more quickly. Okay, next. Th these are just some more things. I think I'll go on from there. One other thing, the Trump administration is kind of a fact-free zone. They don't care about science and facts. They just, what is truth is whatever Trump makes up at the moment. And then a lot of his followers believe that, which is what's dangerous. 
Whereas to deal effectively with the coronavirus, we need to deal with facts and science and so on. And, you know, democracy is at stake in everything right now, but I won't get into all that right now. Okay, next one. Okay, a few statistics on the coronavirus. The most important thing is the U.S. has 4% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's cases. So we obviously haven't dealt with it very um, effectively. And um, all right, and then um, I have different things of Trump's leadership, if I can read this here that, you know, it, it just there's a bunch of things. He has not taken it seriously. He never developed a national plan and instead left the states to all deal with it on their own, which meant they were competing for scarce resources, which raised the price of everything they were trying to get. And then more recently, he's hired Dr. Scott um, Atlas to be his main advisor, and he doesn't have any background in, in pandemic diseases. He's a radiologist, and he's been pushing with Trump this herd immunity theory. And that basically says that you try to um, what you do is you let everybody get the darn virus and, and then hopefully most people don't die, but you try to isolate elderly and people with, you know, extenuating circumstances to make them more vulnerable to the virus. But that was tried in Sweden and I don't think it's been very effective because you can't totally isolate older people, for example. You have to have younger people take care of them, just as one example. So it's, it's, it's what every, most, most people say is if you try to follow the herd immunity theory, um, then you're going to have a lot more people getting sick and being hospitalized and even and die. And you might have 100,000 or more deaths resulting that didn't have to happen. And, but that's been what Trump has been trying to do more recently. And, um, and that now since the election, he's kind of gone AWOL and just is not even doing much. He hasn't met with the coronavirus task force he set up and the federal government for five months, et cetera. So not much leadership there. Okay, next. I mean, the main thing with Trump always was that he was so anxious to get the economy going again because he thought it would help his reelection that he didn't want to take the virus seriously. And that's been the big problem. Um, okay, um, so as I said, we're now in a second wave. This is what's interesting. At one point, we were when Trump was saying, let's all go back to work and school and everything, there were like 40,000 new cases a day but Dr. Fauci was saying, ideally, we should have had down to 10,000 case, new cases a day if we really, before we reopened uh, businesses. And then now we're having, a hundred. we had a, up to 100,000 and now it's over 150,000 new cases a day happening in the United States. So we're not doing well in this winter could be really pretty bad for people and a lot more deaths because we, we haven't gotten a handle on it. Okay, next. Um, this timeline for the development of vaccines, there have been two companies that have come out recently. There's supposed to be over 100 companies trying to develop a vaccine. And then um, it, Moderna and uh, Pfizer are two that have come out and they're, they're, they're both about 95% effective, which is a very high rate from their clinical stage three trials. And um, so there are other issues. There's huge logistical issues once the virus becomes available. It may start to be available some by the end of December, but then you know, you've got to figure out who gets it first, which is a huge logistical thing. And there's temperature issues like the Pfizer one has to be at an extremely cold temperature and the facilities for that don't exist lots of places. And then you've got to figure out who gets it first, like healthcare workers, and then you have other essential workers and so on. And then you are in the elderly and then eventually the people are saying probably the mass public won't get virus uh, vaccines available to them probably till next spring. So in the meantime, we still have to try to not uh, encourage the spread of it by wearing masks and uh, keeping social distancing, washing our hands, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, um, next. Oh, there's one other issue, by the way, on the vaccine, which is also anti-vaxxers. You know, there have been a lot of people that don't want vaccines. And you have to get something, I think, like 60, 70 percent of the population being willing to get vaccines if you want to stop the spread of it. So that, you know, but now I think there are more people maybe willing to get a vaccine than maybe wouldn't have otherwise, like for a flu or something. 
Um, okay, now I'm going to go on and look at implications for peace and for seven evolving aspects of peace that I've worked on with my late husband, Paul Smoker, and so on. So if you, um, so, okay, the next, um, if you, the next, if you look at, okay, this is a diagram of across the top are seven evolving aspects of peace. Uh, next, if you go to the next, it looks at these seven types of peace. And the first, I'm going to go through the first two on war prevention and then um, two more about eliminating physical and structural violence. And then the last is the need to create positive complex whole systems views of peace. So next. Okay. So I'm going to go through each of those seven types of peace. And the first is, I'm just going to give a few points on each one, but you know how the virus impacts each of these aspects of peace, which is something new now to look at. So for, first is peace is absence of war and physical violence, the first aspect of peace, which everybody else, you know, everybody uh, agrees, you know, in the literature, that's an important aspect of peace to look at. Um, but what's interesting is the coronavirus is obviously a different type of enemy. It's an invisible enemy. And lots of times people could even have symptoms and not know it. And so it's a different type of um, strategies that are necessary to deal with it. But it's still an existential threat because people are dying from it. And more people will die the, the more we don't deal with it. Um, so um, what else? Um, OK, the next, because I'm, I'm going to repeat here. Okay, the next type of peace is setting up international institutions to keep the peace and balance different actors' interests. So in the international system, what the aspect of, of the international system relating to the virus is WHO or the World Health Organization. And here again, this is where you try to share information from different countries and possible solutions, policies, and so on. And the US under Trump did the wonderfully brilliant, stupid thing, frankly, of with withdrawing funding, reducing US funding for it, and then withdrawing the US from the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic, which is like, in my opinion, the stupidest thing in the world to do. But he's, you know, his ultra right wing nationalism, which is also a global trend, by the way, in a number of countries, and that's something to be concerned about. But in any case, you know, um, this has not helped. But Biden will take office, you know, hopefully at January 20th. And he is pledged to immediately rejoin WHO, the Paris Climate Agreement, and various other things that uh, uh, Trump took us out of. OK, next. Um, the third is the need to eliminate structural violence, which, which is where people suffer indirectly because the structure of the system doesn't meet their needs, and also promoting and supporting uh, social justice questions. And I think on this. Um, what's, what's really become very apparent to people pretty early on is that there are various groups of people, even though the virus, everyone is vulnerable to the virus, there are certain groups that are much more uh, lap, uh, apt to be affected negatively by the virus. And that includes all the healthcare workers, which are exposed to the virus more, also all the essential workers in all kinds of industries like grocery stores, even post offices, garbage pickup, and you name it, all food production. I mean, all those industries, people are more likely to be exposed to the virus and to get it um, and so on. And then what I noted, um, uh, let's go to the next one here. Um, one aspect that is, okay, no, the next one. Well, okay, I'm, I'm, okay, what I wanted to say on that other one is a big issue today is also, um, I don't know if I've got where I put this here. There, you know, there's all kinds of, um, there's been a craziness because Trump has appealed to sort of white nationalism and white supremacy um, and gotten people who feel threatened by, you know, he's appealed to fear in people and, and has not tried to bring people together, which has divided people already before the virus happened. But, you know, after the George Floyd killing and the racial issue became very prominent, but then many of the people that, uh, let me get to the next one, because that also, there's the people that are most exposed to the virus are essential workers who tend to be more minorities and uh, women. And then also, uh, and the other thing, if you get to the women one here, the, the, the women, there's an interesting quote here by this woman who's in London now um, named, if you can see, um, I can't, 
anyway, her, she said the pandemic has made clear now uh, how much of the economy relies on unpaid labor, mostly shouldered by women, as well as the undervalued jobs uh, in female uh, dominated industries. And how can government now uh, start to elevate these jobs and weave them into broader economic growth indicators? So she has this interesting idea that you know, we need to find a way to include um, unpaid labor in GNP figures because it has value. And, and also to figure out new ways to revise capitalism to give more prominence to the public sector as a very important uh, sector to in, initiate innovation in societies, which can then go to the private sector later. But, you know, there's been a trend more lately, she's talking about that, you know, people are just talking about innovation from the private sector and then it's, that's not really what the way it works. Okay, so so basically, women have been also hurt by the virus, as well as uh, blacks and many minorities, uh, Latinos and, and Native Americans, especially, um, because they tend to be more in these service sector jobs that make them more vulnerable. Or they've been people who've been lost their jobs. That's another big thing. And then they have to, you know, there's another thing. Some women have given up their jobs because they want to stay at home to take care of their kids which when, when we've had homeschooling because of the virus. And then other people have had to still keep working, other women, because they have to support their families and then they're leaving their kids at home. And there are other issues at home. There's been more incidences of domestic violence because people all at home and more suicides has also happened. Um, but then there's also some cases of more people getting close to their family all stuck at home together. So next, so there's different diverse effects. Okay, then there's the last three types of piece that my late husband and I worked on were looked at from more of a positive whole systems point of view of dynamic interdependent aspects of a, of a system over time. So the fifth is intercultural peace. So how do we bring the diversity of the world's peoples together in their different cultural, civilization, religious, racial diversity, and so on in positive ways. And on this, I'll just say that there's whole fields of intercultural communication, of interfaith dialogue, I've been involved with all of those, um, that have all kinds of tools to help people learn to create more understanding between diverse groups of people and have more positive dialogue where they don't have to agree about everything, but they can find areas of common ground and create more understanding in a positive way. So next. And this is where um, the issue, I mean, I think today we have a battle going on between kind of right wing tendencies, which are kind of very nationalistic, populist, neo fascist, where the dominant group in a society tries to, you know, be lifted up and then you blame and scapegoat all the minorities in society. And this, I won't go through all the countries where this is happening, but it's not just the United States under Trump. Um, but um, so the opposite is all the values of cooperation, working together, understanding and honoring diversity as a positive trait and, and that different traditions can bring different gifts to the table of humanity and all of these types of things, which is what's needed to, to deal also effectively with the virus. But I think one other important issue here quickly is that social media has played a big role today in creating all kinds of space for conspiracy theories and and crazy ideas proliferating rapidly like QAnon and stuff like that. And, and then you get people on the right accepting these and propagating them on Fox News and places and then Trump repeats it. And this has not helped to bring society together at all. It's, you know, helped to, so there's gonna be probably in the future coming up more pressure on companies like Facebook and Twitter and others um, to, to have to try better to regulate hate speech on their prep on their platforms which is an ongoing problem okay next okay the another type of piece is called gaia piece or the you know the gaia hypothesis of the earth is a living system but the finding peace of humans with the earth and other species many of which are endangered as humans dominate and take over more and more of the earth and here i would just say that you know, probably because of the coronavirus, a lot of people have focused more on the virus as opposed to the ongoing issue of global climate change. But this is another existential issue that we desperately need to be paying attention to that is also getting worse. And we've had more fires in California where I live, more uh, worse hurricanes in the Gulf area and so on, all because of gl uh, climate change. So this is an issue, even if we get out of the coronavirus, we're gonna have to start 
you know, some people have always been focusing on this, but we're going to have to, as a society, deal, start dealing with this much more seriously. Because there's a basic futures principle also that if you, the longer you wait to deal with an issue, the harder it is to turn it around. Okay, next. I'm trying to go quickly here. The last is inner peace added to all the forms of outer peace. And here the virus has obviously put a lot of stress on people being kept cooped up at home, having um, virus fatigue, et cetera. Some, as I said, some people having more domestic violence and so on, um, and other people finding some value, spending time home together. But re right now we have holidays coming up, Thanksgiving and then Christmas and Hanukkah and various things. And those could be super spreader events again that will, you know, if people are not careful to, to spread the virus some more. So if people, some, if people are open to prayer, meditation, so on, this can maybe help them find moments of peace in the midst of the pressures they're facing. Okay, next. Okay, now I'm gonna look a few, at a few inter implications of the virus for future studies field, which is another field I've done for a long time. And what's interesting about this is um, um, because clearly the trends, you know, where we're going are gonna have been changed by the virus. So it's, it has a lot of impacts for our future that we're creating as well. So futurists don't claim, I'm gonna just compare a few things of future studies with peace studies because I've been involved with both. Futures don't claim to predict the future. That's very important. They say there's many alternative futures. There's possible futures, anything that could happen. Probable futures, which are anything that, that are things that are most likely to happen. And preferable futures, which are what we would most like to have happen. And I think, you know, there's overlap here with, with peace studies clearly, but the idea here is to figure out what is the preferable future that you would most like to create uh, for society and so on. And then how do you make preferable futures become more probable by putting more people and resources to address and create the more desirable outcomes? Um, and futurists though, as a field, it's broader than peace studies, I think, because you can look at the future of anything and everything, but there is overlap. And if you have a broader view of peace, like the seven aspects of peace I just went through, then there's a lot more overlap also with, with the future studies field. And futurists also like to look at things within a, a dynamic interdependent whole systems point of view. So a change in one area interpact, it interrelates over time with changes in other areas. So you get more whole systems uh, thinking uh, desirable in future studies. Okay, next. Um, okay, then uh, another thing today is change is accelerating for a number of reasons. There's a lot of new technologies on the horizon. We may be going beyond the information age to a whole new ages and we're sort of between ages. And so that also creates uncertainty in, in people and so on. Um, people, futurists also stress there's more uncertainty today and they never claim, as I said, to predict the future. But you, when you get more complex systems with more diversity in them, then more, there's more different things that can, can create change. Um, and, but futurists also, the one thing I like about it, futurists are, you know, I think pretty committed to try to empower people to better understand change and in the process of that to see more options in change that could be more uh, positive for them. So you wanna to try to also empower people to bring about more desirable alternative futures. Okay, next. I don't know how many of you remember Elise Boulding, but she uh, was quite a famous, uh, she um, was a famous futurist has passed on now. But she used to do futures workshops, but she also translated a book by um, Fred Pollack called The Image of the Future. And there's a famous quote from that book that futurists look at, which is, if civilization without positive images of itself is doomed. So the idea here is that it's not enough if you want to bring about desirable change to just know the things you want to get rid of in society you have to also have a clear image of what you want to create as an alternative. Otherwise, you just are unhappy with the state of things, but you're not moving on to something more desirable. And so uh, Elise did um, workshops that were called um, peace, global peace workshops or global futures uh, workshops. And what she would do is have people try to envision what would be a peaceful society 30 years in the future. And then um, after you flesh out what that would look like, you know, what is a really peaceful society at that point? And then what, um, uh, 
then you go back and you look 30 years back to the present and what are the changes that happen have, have to happen from where you are now to where you want to be at these 30 years into the future. So I think one thing if you wanted it, people could do is not just look at the future as a peaceful state in 30 years, but what is a to envision a desirable future post COVID, you know, once we get through that to some kind of a new normal. Okay, next. I'm getting done here. Um, so, so futurists um, have developed a number of methodologies of which only a couple I'm going to mention because the future is a weird field because it hasn't yet happened. However, there's many, many methodologies to study what it might be. And there's trend extrapolation, like you look at trends and you extend them into the future, and then you see if they're moving in a more positive or negative direction. And if they're going in a more negative direction, then you have to intervene to change it. And, uh, and then scenarios are a sequence of events that could uh, follow. Scenario, scenarios are very popular futures methodology, but you start out with certain initial conditions that you spell out and assume exist. And then what are the sequence of events that could follow from that? So the next, uh, next page. Okay, so I, the, just looking at some examples of say best case, worst case, most probable case scenarios on COVID. Um, so the best case scenario is that people take the virus very seriously, practice social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera, so do contact tracing and have tests and all the things that people are still recommending and doing it very uh, from the very beginning. So you get a handle on it quickly, but we didn't do that. So worst case scenario is you don't take the virus seriously and people go around not wearing masks, not doing social distancing, going to super spreader events, which, you know, unfortunately Trump has been creating at the White House and in his rallies, different places. And and then the whole thing just extends much longer and, and affects more people and more people that can die. And a mixed case, this is what's interesting, a mixed case, which is probably more probable, scenario for the future is where you, some people take things more seriously, other people don't. But what I found is that then you still have the whole virus, you know, danger continuing. So it, it, it's not enough to just do a half-hearted where some people follow guidelines for health and other people don't. And then the next, next one, I also had three scenarios here parallel kind of for the um, global warming and climate change. And it's the same kind of a thing happens. The best case is everybody really takes everything very seriously and follows stringent guidelines. But the worst case is people don't take it very seriously and then it gets worse and worse. Um, and then the longer you wait, the harder it is to bring around the problem. Um, and a mixed case, it seems in both of these existential issues, a mixed case scenario, which is at the moment more probable, it doesn't do the job enough because you don't get enough people, you know, you get too many people not taking either of these conflicts seriously, that you still end up with a lot of problems and the, and the crisis doesn't end up being solved. It continues, maybe not as fast as a worst case scenario, but anyway, so that, okay, now, um, no, go ahead, next. And that, that was my next point is that, you know, half-hearted measures don't seem to do the job with these existent, either of these two existential crises, which should make us take note. Okay, the next. Okay, I'm, uh, the last I have is a poem. Do I have time to read the poem? Anybody? Okay, it's called Conflicting Values in the Age of Corona. I wrote this back in mid-April when all of this was, you know, taking off in the first wave and now we're in a second wave, but anyway. And I'm done here. So Corona, Corona, what a puzzle you pose. Shall we reopen our economy before our health is assured? How quickly is it safe to return to jobs and to school when adequate um, testing is not yet available? If going back to work is initiated too soon, the virus can spread more with a second fall wave. Then it's back to our homes to self-isolate once again with further negative consequences to our economic well-being. Um, so what shall it be, our health or our jobs? Neither choice is risk-free, a most difficult conundrum. Until a vaccine is available, we remain at the mercy. I can't see the rest of the page here at the bottom. Can you move that up a little? I don't know. Maybe, I, well. Um, I but I can read it. OK. Um, <laughs> We remain well, at the mercy of this virus and its impacts upending our lives. Okay, and then the next next one, and then this is the, last, the, rest, the rest of the poem. 
a most challenging time for all humanity on this earth. Can we all work together to find solutions for us all that will lessen the burden and the stress on us all as we navigate through these unknowns? Oh, good God, let's hope so. Both science and spirit are important on this journey. The experts must speak while we keep our spirits intact, but evolution has a way when new challenges appear to unleash creative new endeavors, uh, ventures that move humanity forward. The old must give way to the new and the different. Adaptation is essential along with creative new ideas. Only then will we discover new stages in our lives. Read the last two lines, I'm sorry. And a new human future awaiting us all. Right, okay. So that's it for me. Now that's how to contact me if anyone wants and I'm happy to send my PowerPoint to anybody if they want it. Excellent. Thank you both for presenting. And we ha we do have a couple of questions in the chat box, one which I ask and one which uh, Kaylin asked. And people can throw others in there and I can read them. If people would like to ask their own questions, you can also open your mic. You have the ability to do that as well as your video and ask. My, I'll start with the first one, which was the question I threw in the chat, which is just trying to connect the two talks in a way. Um, this idea of differentiating stigmas as a type of violence as distinguished from dehumanization as a meaning-making tool. How, my question is basically, how does that kind of a framing help us to overcome this kind of ongoing context of polarization that we find ourselves in? Um, so I'll kind of open that up to either one of the presenters if they'd like to start. And um, Anushka, since you, you, you talk specifically about those kind of definitions, maybe you want to take the first stab. Actually, that's a very challenging question <laughs> uh, because um, we have for over the past few years, and also if you look at uh, history on conflict, kind of in a cyclical uh, way, like the economy. We, we go from periods in which we have a lot of right-minded um, tendencies to periods in which it's all about our common humanity. And so we, we fluctuate between the two extremes. And I think since um, World War II, we've been fluctuating towards the idea that we're, we have a common humanity, that we all should actually bring together. If you look at the creation of the European Union and how that's falling apart now, everything that was geared towards actually um, creating commonality and uh, joining us, um, making us work together on the basis of a common humanity that could actually help undermine stigmas, violence, and just establish positive peace overall rather than just simply existing in a negative peace state. It's challenging because over the past few years, all of that shift has actually been undermined. So how do we overcome it? I think we have to start building our way back to a point in which rather than um, um, exploding bridges, <laughs> we can actually rebuild these bridges and do emphasize rather than the competition, say for instance, a vaccine, uh, acknowledging the fact that we all need it and consequently, we should find a way to actually share it um, and exploit it. That's just one example. But that would be, generally speaking, the best way to actually see how we're going to do that. I think we have to come together and work on reestablishing the meanings that provide those bridges. We, we have to start somewhere. Would, would you like me to say a couple things sure. also? Sure. Yeah, this is interesting. I found your presentation very interesting. I have a slightly different take on, um, on um, dehumanization because I've written stuff. I have a book coming out in chapter two is on nonviolence. And yep. so I've looked at, you know, to me in the nonviolence field, um, dehumanization is what we do to people to justify that it's okay to kill them or treat them badly. You know, so for me, I don't see it so much as a, you know, I see it as a sort of more negative thing. You know, it's like you go to war and you, you have to dehumanize your opponent so you can justify that it's okay to kill them. So the nonviolence uh, field, I think, and all these different practitioners of nonviolence 
from Gandhi on, and there's a whole bunch of different people. But you know, I think that they try to avoid dehumanization from happening, if at all possible, to try to keep dialogue open between opponents and everything, and and not to dehumanize uh, their opponent totally, but you know, to try to elevate their thinking, to realize there's a moral just issue here that needs to be addressed, stuff like that. So I would say that, but you know, I do future studies too. And I think we're in an age, we've had the agricultural age, industrial age, information age, and now there's a whole bunch of new technologies without going through them all that are raising enormous new issues. And I think we're in another gap between a whole new age emerging that's gonna be impacted by many new, these new technologies. We have the earthing crisis all over the place. We have humanity interacting more and more. And you have right now all these sort of right wing nationalistic populist movements happening in a number of countries that I mentioned before that is not helping at all to bring humanity together, you know? And Trump is an example number one of this. Um, but it's happening in, in many countries. I mean, it's in Russia, China, Hungary, Poland, Philippines, Brazil, India. There's a lot of kind of right-wing nationalism in a number of, number of countries. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening now? And it seems how somehow there's an anti-globalization reaction, but also people, you know, you, you've got leaders emerging in all these countries that are using fear to try to divide their own populations, you know, and to elevate the dominant group in their society, but to kind of scapegoat other minorities in their society and to also be anti-globalization cooperation. But what's interesting to me is the, va the vaccine, as you said, and I've noted too, is we're not gonna solve the, the coronavirus problem until we all cooperate and get the vaccine available to everyone who will take it you know, and, and get it under control. And it's not gonna just be in our own countries and it's not gonna just be a dominant majority. It's gonna have to be everybody in countries and all different countries in the world because people travel today all the time and all kinds of stuff. And there's no way it's not gonna spread if you don't deal with everybody. So it is a shift in values that I was trying to say too that we need, but it's not where every society is today. And it's, it's a really big challenge that we need to go back and focus on what are the important values that that we as human beings you know value and and including life and so on and and the planet you know saving the planet too um, and other species so i mean there's we we need a big paradigm shift in our thinking i guess i would say to to recognize that we actually are we need an interdependent world views because what people have been these nationalist groups advocate are sort of, I'm separate from you and I'm better than you and I don't have to care about you. I only care about my own group. And what we have to get back and realize is that everything is interdependent and what happens to you affects me and what happens to me affects you. And it's a whole paradigm shift that we've got to um, get people to accept on a much bigger scale. I have one additional comment if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, actually listening to you talk about the whole idea of, um, well, globalization and this reaction to it, uh, it reminded me recently that uh, in the context of dehumanization, um, one of the things that I'm concerned about that I'm seeing in the newer generation, say my niece who's a teenager and things like that, it's from a historical perspective, there is uh, this trivialization of history because a lot of the generations that experience extreme forms of violence in which dehumanization was so pervasive, say the Holocaust survivors or the survivors of the genocides are actually dying out. So our link to the vividness of that history is actually dying. So you find the newer generation making fun of that old generation. And in that process, there is this element of just dehumanizing the severity of those experiences and what it meant for history. And I think because of that, it's a lot easier to just forget how we got here and the need for that common humanity and finding uh, uh, commonalities as, as humans. So it's, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I mean, some of those fields of intercultural communication, interfaith dialogue, and so on, are one, are fields that give people tools to bring people together across very diverse backgrounds and share, and they don't have to agree about everything, but they can create more understanding and, and start to see the humanity in each other. You know, that's extremely important today. Yeah, you've started to answer the second question that was there, there but I was going to ask Kaylin if you wanted uh, to jump in and say anything she sorry 
Uh, I wasn't sure when I said that. I didn't. We should all do pronouns, actually. And I didn't think that was. Oh, yeah. um, but no, uh, so I don't know if you wanted to expand, Kaylin, on what you said in terms of your question, because in a way we've kind of addressed it. But these issues of power and globalization, I think, are quite an interesting. You know, creating common good. You know, as I'm listening, I'm thinking about this sense of public good has has dissipated since World War II, right? And so I don't know if that ties into what you'd like to say, but go ahead, Kaylin. Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here and hear what you guys have to say. I guess you did kind of answer my question um, previously, but I think I what I really struggle with too is just how I feel like Americans especially are kind of living like divergent realities right now. It's like we're experiencing two different realities that are just really delineated by you know political lines. And I just have like, I really am struggling to tactically think about how to actually fix that problem. Um, and I think also something that maybe you guys could speak to is like the role of youth. Um, I just did like a webinar on anti-racism, um, but folk with a focus on youth, um, which I think is like a, a, a demographic that's not really tapped into a lot when we look at like, you know, I think youth are like the, the peace builders of the future, obviously. So I'm just wondering like what you guys think, like what role youth could play, maybe you could speak to that. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'll be happy to reply to that. I think youth are extremely important <laughs> and they're the key to our future. And also I think even in the recent election, there were a lot more youth voting. And I think generally you can tell me if this is correct, but young people today overall seem to be more open to diversity you know, and accepting of it, it's not a big thing if you're LGBTQ or if you're black or white or Latino or whatever. I mean, it's just accepted. And this is a very healthy development. And so all power to the youth. <laughs> if we can get the youth to impact the older generation more, I think that would be good too. But do you agree? I think young people are much more open. And I think, and I think young people probably are open globally to interact with each other as well. So. Um, I, I actually thought uh, your, your question was very interesting um, because I think one of the reasons why there is so much information is because um, we have a, a lack of credibility of authoritative institutions. Um, for the past century, we've actually grown to learn that those who provide, who are in, in power positions to actually provide correct information, uh, such as governments or healthcare officials, have actually contributed to a lot of the misinformation or have contributed to a lot of the human rights violations. Say, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the literature on how throughout the first half of the 20th century, healthcare providers actually led um, an infertility campaign uh, with certain minorities in the United States. You have the syphilis experiment, um, the... Um, <laughs> well, the Holocaust, it's, it's a major example of that. So before we used to look at these institutions and these professionals as authoritative uh, information uh, units within our societies, but over the past century, we've grown to question everything because not only do they misinform us for their own reasons, but they actually commit, rather than protecting us, they commit a lot of the violations that they should be standing against. And as to the youth, um, my concern is the current climate of the council culture. That is, there may be a lot of more discussion about diversity and we may be a lot more open. Say for instance, the pronouns that we now write emails and you have the pronouns. So we actually own and respect the individuals who provide that. Um, but at the same time, anything that constitutes disagreement um, actually leads into polarization because we're so entrained rather than discussing things, we are just so obsessed with canceling the other person rather than just, hey, we have different opinions. I respect yours, you respect mine, but we don't engage that, that way. We just wanna ostracize anyone who has a different opinion from us. So, mm. <laughs> I'm so glad you raised that actually, because I, while I think that yes, the, the conversation about diversity among, amongst younger folks and the youth is a great 
push forward, there is a lot of pushback as well. And I think some of that does come from the, the far left, right? So we can blame the far right all the time, but there's a lot of far left cancel culture, as you said. And, and even as you said earlier, the history, you know, the, the kind of lack of respect for history and understanding of that history, that plays out as, as trauma transfers from body to body, generation to generation, it's still there, but sometimes that kind of anti, I would even call it an anti-intellectualism within our society, particularly our society, but I think the world as a whole has had a kind of a, a move towards anti-intellectualism and that kind of disregards this past trauma and this past history, and then creates distrust in those institutions, which we used to have trust and building up of. So I don't know if others would like to chime into that conversation, but I think that's a fascinating part of this kind of, for lack of a better term, polarization that we find. I'm not sure I like the term polarization either. I think it um, it it doesn't it misses something in some ways, right? That it misses that that kind of underlying social cultural trauma that 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 does transfer from body to body, as we know from research. Right. But uh, so I don't know. I'd love to hear what other people have to say in relation to that and, and, and particularly in relation to youth as being the kind of agent of of change for for this. Yeah, Alan, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you both very much. Very interesting. Lots of good food for thought. Well, lots of it is depressing. You know what? You can't uh, solve a problem until you face it. So it's well, well worth it to go there. I just wanted to um, comment on, um, you know, I've been an educator all my life. I'm retired now. And so just doing, um, you know, organizational work, but I've always felt like uh, education is the key and youth are the answer. You know, like when I taught peace studies or conflict resolution or human rights or even English, which I taught so that people would stop killing each other, um, you know, that, that, they can institute change. And, and I have three children of my own who are uh, 33, 31, and 29. And they are all, you know, as, um, as Jeremy, or as, uh, I forget who brought it up, but I mean, they are all, uh, none of them are members of the LGBTQ community, but they have very many members, and we have other members in our family. Anyway, so I'm, I've just been on this bandwagon about you know, that's why, that's our hope and, and, and they get it more. And then Charlottesville happened. And I'm looking at all these 20 something young white men chanting blood and soil and Confederate flags and Nazi flags. And, and I, you, you know, my husband's also an educator and we're both pretty well educated. And so we've always kind of acted like, well, you know, people who aren't well educated, you know, which only feeds the anti-intellectualism in the country. I think when you act like, well, you just don't know because that's what we think, but that doesn't bring anyone over to wanting to read a book or have dialogue. But um, I, I was thinking again, you know, like young people, they know more, they have access to more. But now that we've got all these bad internet sites and we've had the worst leader, I, my husband's a historian, he would probably say the worst leader in the history of mankind. Um, I mean, right up there with Hitler. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's responsible for at least half the deaths in this country right now, I would say. Um, so if, you, how are we going to, how are we going to deal with this that w when you say we can't just agree to disagree or we want to I, I want to ostracize someone who's telling me a Nazi flag is okay I don't want to dialogue with them I don't want to even say well you can think what you think the president said that there's good people on both sides which I found horrific I think we got to call out people who so uh Kaylin or anyone uh Anuska anyone young, if you can tell me, like, you must run across people who are, I think it's much more a problem of the right than the left, but that probably is because I'm on the left. 
I mean, I think this is, we've gotten so polarized that the dialogue has cut down, shut down. And then the other problem is that, you know, I mean, I, I had the same views you do about Trump. I mean, from the day one, when he announced, I've been horrified and been keeping track of him and, you know, keeping track of how he's tried to demonize anybody who doesn't agree with him, which is, you know, his narcissism and everything else. But it's very dangerous to have somebody with that much power in the presidency who has those kinds of extremely div divisive attitudes. And now he's trying to over throw, now he's trying to have a coup because he's tried to have all these court cases. I'm so that's a little digression, you know, but, um, and hasn't gotten anywhere with like 30 some court cases trying to ch cause, you know, say there's fraudulent ballots, which they have no evidence for. And then now he's trying to do the much more, even more dangerous and totally anti-democratic thing, which is to try to get legislatures in red states that have Republican legislatures dominating to, to appoint their own lead, um, electors to the Electoral College that are pro-Trump and disregard the vote of the people in their own state. And he's trying to get away with this. And then he keeps being egged on by, I mean, he, his followers that just blindly believe him, that's one of the things I struggle with, is how people can accept. I mean, you know, it's just, it horrifies me too. And I hope that Biden can try to bring things back a little more from the extremes on both sides so that some more dialogue can happen. But it's going to require two to tango, you know, and unless the Republicans are open to working with him too, then he's going to have the same problem Obama at the beginning offered things to the Republicans and then they didn't, they just took it and offered nothing back, you know? So if you're going to have dialogue and compromise, you've got to have both sides be a little willing to do that. Right. And then to, and to just follow on to that point and taking the example of, of, of Republicans, uh, others in the Senate and house who are not speaking out. I no. think that itself is a strategy that undermines kind of intellectual ability, you know, intellectual, because you mentioned evidence, right? And yeah. so it's, you know, people start to lose faith in any kind of an institution to provide evidence for one case or the other, whatever the case may be. Um, I'd love to hear from some, some of the others and, and other people who haven't had a chance to talk. We have a few minutes left. Um, if there are other questions that want to get, get raised or other people want to respond, particularly younger folks who would like to talk about that generation and what you see as the future and, you know, kind of in future studies. Can I just say one little thing very quick and I'll be quiet. I mean, I do think on the right with Trump, there's been a glorification of, of ignorance and, and, and just anything goes, anything you say is true. And even though there's no evidence and, and, and a, a disregard for, for anybody who has any expertise in anything like how to deal with if the coronavirus which you need some expertise so we have to somehow get back to honoring that there's a role for people who know something about something and i'll be quiet <laughs> yeah just sorry one comment on that you also have to be aware of the fact that not all intellectuals actually promote this factual um ideas you, you have the other side that is just able to manipulate or believe whatever it is that they want to believe. So this is not a question as to whether or not I have knowledge or not. Sometimes it all uh, depends on what I want to believe and what I want to tell others to believe and their willingness to actually listen to that because it fits whatever needs they have. So mm -hmm. we are assuming that intellectuals are going to see all on one side, mm -hmm. but that, I don't think that's the reality. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to chime in and share the last minute or so? And then I will wrap up if, if not. But if some of those who haven't had a chance to say something, if you'd like to step in and add to the dialogue. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I just, um, I, I was just thinking while we were all talking, this, thanks for this. It's great. But I was just thinking if, if somehow our education system, I'm coming from Canada, by the way, but um, if somehow our education system had moved too much from the, from the hard side to the soft side, where we started providing these sort of comfortable, safe spaces for our students, you know, that all ways of thinking were, were fine and that having your voice heard was really important and it was good to have your opinion, which was fun. And I think that's really good and empowering. And I, but part of me wonders that that had somehow created space 
for these temptations of power fueled by fear. And we're starting to feel these, like almost see like this pendulum, right? Just like mm. our, you know, how we always see and moving back. And now we're kind of in the middle and we're realizing, wait a second, now we have to really consider. And sometimes, uh, although it's really good to create these safe spaces, how we're creating these safe spaces, maybe we forgot to talk about. I was just thinking, mm. thanks. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for, for sharing this kind of broad sweep of history that, that both panelists, you know, helped us think through. I, I appreciate it. I know that we're also out of time and I apologize for that. This conversation could go on and on and on, I'm sure. Um, I want to, and, and I'm a little cognizant of the time because I know that uh, at four o'clock, there is actually, if you have children in your house and you would like to join, there's a storytelling session um, with a, 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 Native, um, a Native American woman who's a storyteller and it's specifically geared towards children that starts at four o'clock, which is less than a half an hour from now. So you can go to the link I put in the box to see that as well. If you wanna read more about her, her name is Luis Amoto Kessel. Um, and then of course, tonight uh, at seven Eastern time, uh, we have an award ceremony, uh, the PGSA award ceremony and membership meeting, which we hope you all will attend as well as then on Saturday, there are events too. There are actually two um, different sessions on Saturday, one being uh, about constructive stories in response to polarization. So this conversation will continue. And then the second being our kind of final keynote by Brandon Brown, uh, which is at seven Eastern on Saturday night. Um, Many sides of silence polarized narratives as blockades to justice and healing. Um, so those are the, so the conversation continues. I, I, I'll, I'll uh, leave it there. And I, I definitely thank you for all attending today and look forward to seeing you in some of those other sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.